Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Friday Ramblings. We are here because it is Friday, and on Friday we do ramble about all things pop culture awesome. Since it is September, we are going to blast back to the past of professional wrestling as we dig up the legacy of world championship wrestling, because, hey, it's all Georgia, yeah? WCW's headquartered in Georgia. I'm headquartered in Georgia. It's a thing. A little bit of a soft spot. Specifically, their in September annual pay-per-view, Ball Brawl. Because, as I said, it's September. And that's what WCW did in September. It's thematic. I think I was almost a professional the way I do that sometimes. Now, it should be noted that we are going to focus primarily on the full pay-per-view editions of Fall Brawl. Though I am going to note for the sake of trivia completionists that, yes, the term Fall Brawl was originally used to refer to the annual fall editions of Clash of the Champions in 88, 89, 90, and 91. There was no fall brawl event of any kind held in 1992. Because fall brawl, even in the Clash of the Champions days, almost always featured a War Games match, it is considered by many to be WCW's comparison to the WWF's annual Survivor Series pay-per-view event due to the Survivor Series match like War Games being, an, being a massive team match and that Survivor Series being held in November and only occur, you know occurred in roughly the same part of the calendar year as Fall Brawl. Now WWE has owned the rights to the Fall Brawl, Fall Brawl name since they purchased WCW in 2001, although they have not produced the event under the main banner. Their developmental territory, Ohio Valley Wrestling, did use the Fall Brawl name, so yeah, it was kind of a pseudo-use thing. And of course, the Fall Brawl pay-per-views can be viewed on the WWE Network currently. Assuming that Peacock hasn't decided to just randomly take them off because that's just bad business, sloppy shop. Not going to get too deep into that because we keep things positive here. Now, we're not going to go through every single solitary match on every single fall brawl because even restricting ourselves to the pay-per-view versions, we are dealing with eight different pay-per-views. We're going to kind of touch on the best of the best in these years and give you the quick rundown. So the original Fall Brawl, subtitled War Games, was in 1993 and took place at the Astro Arena in Houston, Texas. Eight matches were contested at the event. And your match is worth noting is Lord Steven Regal, known to WWE and NXT fans as William Regal, defeated Ricky Steamboat for the WCW World Television Championship. You also had the Nasty Boys with Missy Hyatt defeating Arn Anderson and Paul Roma of the Four Horsemen for the WCW World Tag Team Championship. Rick Rude defeating Ric Flair with his maid Fifi for the WCW International World Heavyweight Championship. And we're definitely going to have to do a video discussing the International World Heavyweight Championship because that is one of the most interesting nature of WCW's championship history. It involves some um, court legality things. Hmm. But the main event of your 1993 Ball Brawl was the War Games match featuring Sting, Davey Boy Smith, Dustin Rhodes, and the infamous Shockmaster, a.k.a. Fred Ottman, a.k.a. Tugboat, a.k.a. Typhoon, defeating the team of Sid Vicious, Vader, and Harlem Heat, which of course includes the Hall of Famer Booker T., 
and his brother Stevie Ray, although at this point they were still going under their original Harlem Heat names of Cole and Kane. Harlem Heat was managed by Colonel Robert Parker at the time, Sid Vicious and Vader being managed by Harley Race. So, it's all good, folks. Good times. In 1994, we had in the dark match, the brother team of Brad Armstrong and Brian Armstrong defeating Bad Attitude, which is Steve Kern and Bobby Eaton. For those of you trivia nuts, Bad Attitude was an interesting team because Steve Kern and Bobby Eaton, may he rest in peace, it has still been very soon since Bobby Eaton passed on, we're all still feeling his loss, but... Steve Kern and Bobby Eaton had both teamed with Stan Lane in iconic tag teams. Steve Kern and Stan Lane being part of the Fabulous Ones previous to this, and Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton being the third version of the Midnight Express, and my personal favorite version. No offense to Dennis Condry. We also had our buddy Lord Steven Regal back as he lost the WCW World Television Championship to Johnny B. Bad, who would go on to fame in WWE as Mark Marrow, a.k.a. Sable's first husband. Kevin Sullivan defeated Cactus Jack in a Loser Leaves WCW match. Which, you know, that's what you did when it was... Time for a wrestler to go to another promotion. They lost a Loser Leafs Town match, or in this case, Loser Leafs Company. Jim Duggan defeated Steve Austin for the WCW United States Heavyweight Championship in 35 seconds in what many people consider to be one of the worst booked moments of Steve Austin's career. Yes, this was still a few years out from his WWF run as Stone Cold Steve Austin, and him being one of the most popular wrestlers in the world. However, this was in the last years of Jim Duggan's in-ring career, and it was seen pretty much as the booking team putting Hulk Hogan and his former WWF buddies over their homegrown talent. This would be one of the reasons why Steve Austin definitely was not too sad to leave WCW shortly thereafter. Now, it should be noted that originally uh, Steve Austin was going to challenge Ricky Steamboat for the WCW United States Championship, but he was suffering from a back injury and could not compete. As a result, Austin won the United States title by forfeit, and this was Steamboat's last appearance in WCW, so he was fired shortly thereafter and decided to retire from the ring. Almost immediately, WCW Commissioner Nick Bockwinkle declared that Austin would defend his title against a mystery opponent. Austin protested it. Hacksaw Jim Duggan came out. 35 seconds later, we have one of the dumbest booking decisions in WCW history. But we are moving on. We also have a team of pretty wonderful Paul Orndorff and Paul Roma, who were the WCW World Tag Team Champions, successfully defending their belt against Stars and Stripe, the team of the Patriot, and Marcus Bagwell. Vader defeated Sting and the Guardian Angel to determine the number one contender for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Man, I actually have listed pretty much... I actually did list every match on this card because for different reasons, every match on this card is either fun to watch for trivia purposes or was significant to what would occur in WCW over the course of the next year. As I said, losing Cactus Jack, completely jobbing out Steve Austin. Um, but it's the thing. The Guardian Angel, for those of you who may not remember, was Ray Trailer, more famously known as the Big Boss Man or Big Bubba. 
And in your annual War Games match, Dusty Rhodes, Dustin Rhodes, and the Nasty Boys defeated the Stud Stable, which was composed of Terry Funk, Arn Anderson, Funkhouse Buck, more famously known as Jimmy Golden, and Colonel Robert Parker. So there you go. Good times. However, we do move on to 1995, where, as I said, things changed. For starters, there's not nearly as many highlight matches, although Johnny B. Bad defeating Brian Pillman is worth seeing because it is a almost 30-minute match, and frankly put, Brian Pillman is always worth watching wrestle, especially in WCW, as this was before his ankle injury that would prevent him from doing a lot of the great high-flying wrestling in ECW and WWF that he became famous for. But uh, on the big match front, we have Diamond Dallas Page with the Diamond Doll, a.k.a. his wife Kimberly, and Max Muscle, a American professional wrestler who basically spent most of his WCW career as a bodyguard for various people. Uh, defeating World Television Champion the Renegade, who was basically an Ultimate Warrior ripoff gimmick. It it was not a good thing. Um, the Renegade character. Uh, the WCW World Tag Team Championship would be competed when champions Bunkhouse Buck and Dick Slater lost the belts to Harlem Heat. Should be noted that Bunkhouse Buck and Dick Slater were being managed by Colonel Robert Parker, and Harlem Heat would be managed by Sister Sherry, better known as Sherry Martell. And this was part of a ongoing feud where Colonel Parker would constantly try to get at Harlem Heat and their manager, Sister Sherry, before becoming romantically involved with Sherry for a brief period. It's wrestling. These things happen. And in your annual War Games match, Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Lex Luger, and Sting defeated the Dungeon of Doom, at this point composed of Kamala, the Zodiac, a.k.a. Brutus the Barber Beefcake, the Shark, also known as John Tenta, Earthquake, and Ming. So, let's look at this right here, folks. On the babyface side, you have Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, two of the most famous wrestlers in all of WWF history. And Kamala, who had been all over the place, working various sorts of territories, but had been part of a major iconic uh, feud with Hulk Hogan. Brutus Barber Beefcake, who was a longtime WWE mainstay and real life friend of Hulk Hogan. Earthquake, who was another former Hogan opponent and had just got, had only recently come off a major WWF run. So, two members of the Babyface team and three members of the Heel team, frankly put, were known to most people as WWF guys. This is important because this is one of the things that plagued WCW in the mid-90s was that transition where they brought in a lot of the old WWE stars but were pushing them so hard so early on, including a lot of the ones that were heels being brought in to feud with Hogan because they had already feuded with Hogan in WWF and so it was just base. It was seen almost as a continuation of the WWF feuds that kind of prevented WCW from finding its own identity and struggling until the rise of the NWO, where because you had classic baby faces like Hogan and Savage turning heel and making a distinct uh, change in personality that. They started feeling like WCW guys, as well as having been there for a few years at this point. 
is part of why, as I said, there's not nearly as many iconic matches worth watching in this uh, particular year because 95 was kind of one of the worst years for WCW. Now, to move things along, here's what you got in 1996. Diamond Dallas Page fought Chavo Guerrero Jr. in a great 13-minute opening match that highlighted the future awesomeness both men would show in WCW. Um, Conan as the AAA Heavyweight Championship those of you who are not super big wrestling fans, AAA is one of the two most important promotions in Mexico. It is not the place you call when your car busts a tire on the side of the highway. But he did defend his title against Juventud Guerrero. Chris Benoit defeated Chris Jericho in an excellent 14-minute match because both men were very young, hungry, and eager to prove themselves in America at this point, so... They did everything they could to seal the show and potentially did, depending on what kind of wrestling you like. The WCW Cruiserweight Championship was successfully defended by Rey Mysterio Jr. over Super Calo. The WCW World Tag Team Championship is still being associated with Harlem Heat, who had now once again managed by Colonel Robert Parker as he and Sister Sherry had become romantically involved at this point, as I said earlier, defeating the Nasty Boys. And the NWO contingent of Hollywood Hogan, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and the NWO Imposter Sting, a.k.a. Jeff Farmer, defeated Team WCW, which was Lex Luger, Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, and Sting in a War Games match. This leads us up to 1997. We're getting there, folks. We're in the back half here. For the WCW Cruiserweight Championship, Eddie Guerrero defeats champion Chris Jericho. Again, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Jericho, uh, pay-per-view. Yes, go ahead and watch it because they are going to put y'all in awe. Alex Wright, as the WCW World Television Championship, successfully defended his belt against internationally known legend Ultimo Dragon. We also had, in a fun gimmick match, Wrath and Mortis, managed by James Vandenberg, who would go on to bigger fame in TNA as Father James Mitchell, or an ECW as the Sinister Minister, depending on your style, defeating the Faces of Fear, Ming and the Barbarian. Finally, the only the big match is worth noting is a 20-minute match in which the NWO, this time fielded by Buff Bagwell, Kevin Nash, Six, and Conan, defeating the Four Horsemen, Chris Benoit, Steve McMichael, Ric Flair, and Kurt Henning. This would be the infamous War Games match in which the only recently recruited Kurt Henning turned on the Four Horsemen to join the NWO, making it functionally a five-on-three handicap match, and in my personal opinion, signaled the death of the Four Horsemen because this was the first time that somebody had turned their back on the Four Horsemen. Traditionally, if somebody left the Horsemen, it was the Horsemen kicking them out. Kurt Henning joining the group and almost immediately betraying them signified the end of the Four Horsemen on a psychological level as they were no longer seen as the group everybody wanted to be affiliated with. That torch now belonged to the NWO. The, horror for, the, the Four Horsemen were officially yesterday's news. Fortunately, the team would continue to exist, but it would never be the same. They were forever after relegated to more mid-card and jobber to the star acts because, hey, it was NWO or bust for the WCW bookers, and 
Yeah, it's been what? 20 years since the company got bought out? Yeah, that was great fucking ideas, you jackasses. But again, we do try to remain positive on this wonderful program. So we get into 1998. For the WCW World Television Championship, you should check out Chris Jericho uh, as part of his very one-sided, one-man angle against Goldberg, defeating a Goldberg impersonator by submission. It is a minute and 15 seconds, but it is... It is heel Chris Jericho at his annoying worst. Which means it's awesome. You have Rick Steiner fighting Scott Steiner to a no contest. Which is mostly just interesting to watch for the sake it is a rare time where the Steiner brothers were feuding with each other instead of teaming with each other. But more importantly, he'd carried the stiff that had Scott Steiner refused to wrestle his brother, he would have been permanently banned from WCW. Match did end in a no contest after Scott Steiner's second buff Bagwell pretended to re-injure his neck. The WCW Cruiserweight Championship was successfully defended when Juventud Guerrera defeated Silver King. And in a Ravens Rules match, Saturn defeated Raven, who was accompanied by Canyon and Lodi. This means this match also led to the um, end of the Ravens stable, the Flock. As for a pre-match stipulation, Saturn victory freed the Flock from Ravens' control. Had Saturn lost, he would have become Ravens' lackey once again. In the, heck, this is just plain awesome wrestling, even if it wasn't greatly booked, Dean Malenko defeated Kurt Henning by disqualification. And in your annual War Games match, Team WCW, this time Diamond Dallas Page, Roddy Piper, and The Warrior, defeated NWO Hollywood, Hollywood Hogan, Bret Hart, and Stevie Ray, and NWO Wolfpack, Kevin Ashton, and Lex Luger in one of, well, frankly put, the most awkward War Game matches, um... To exist because instead of being two five-man teams or even two four-man teams as we saw a couple times it was three three-man teams it was this weird awkward triple threat match that it just it didn't work I've seen the match it's it was a decent WCW match especially by that year's standards where the in-ring product was really starting to suffer. But, I mean, War Games should never be a triple threat match. And it certainly shouldn't be three-man teams. You know, the four was kind of pushing it. It's classically five-man teams, similar to the Survivor Series. But with the right wrestlers, you can get away with a four-on-four match. But a three-on-three-on-three match, it's just... Yeah. For starters, you can't do the, the man advantage, which is, um, again, for people who don't know War Games, um, War Games starts out as a one-on-one -on -one match. And every few minutes, one member of one team enters. So the idea is one team, at, at large portions of the match, will have a man advantage. Two-on-one, three-on-two, four-on-three, five-on-four... Before, it finally becomes 5-on-5, five five, or just take one step out of that for the few years it was 4-on-4. Four four, which is when the match officially begins, the match beyond, as Dusty Rhodes would pitch it when he created the match in the 80s. And it's only at that point when every man on every team is legally entered that you can win the match. But seeing a triple threat, you can't really do that. Because the math gets all screwy-wombly. Still, we bring ourselves to 1999. Uh, your significant matches are champion Lenny Lane defeated Kaz Hayashi for the WCW Cruiserweight Championship. World Television Champion Rick Steiner defeated Perry Saturn. 
the WCW World Tag Team Championship, which is once again held by Harlem Heat. They spend a lot of time as tag team champions at WCW. One of the few things WCW consistently booked right, which was Harlem Heat, who had existed in some smaller promotions before, but were by and large considered by fans to be homegrown talents, constantly either being champions or in championship contention. They defeated the West Texas Rednecks, this, um, which was Barry Windham and his brother Kendall Windham, with Kurt Henning in their corner. Uh, the West Texas Rednecks had been the champions, so we did see the titles change hands. Um, in a real sec, because I do not remember who the West Texas Rednecks beat. Uh, let me see. Um... Okay, they had actually beaten Harlem Heat um, at the previous Road Wild pay per view, so they had held. So the West Texas Rednecks had held the title for uh, t about three weeks before losing it back to the Harlem Heat at Fall Brawl. So that being the only reign for that infamous and mm, somewhat goofily booked stable. Still, if you want to know the best thing about the West Texas Rednecks, go YouTube. Uh, rap is crap. For the WCW United States Heavyweight Championship, Sid Vicious defeated champion Chris Benoit. And we, we have a fall brawl without a War Games. Where's my War Games? Where's my War Games? We lost our War Games. Still, champion Hulk Hogan. Defended and lost the title to the WCW World Heavyweight Championship to Sting. Good times. So that brings us to the final fall brawl, which took place in 2000 at the HSBC Arena in Buffalo, New York. Less than a year before the company was bought out. In fact, uh, about six months before the company was bought out. Your important matches of note is WCW Cruiserweight Championship held by Elix Skipper was successfully defended against Kiwi. The Harris Brothers defeated Chronic in a First Blood Chain match. The WCW United States Heavyweight Championship was up for grabs as Champion Lance Storm defeated General Rection, a.k.a. Hugh Morris. In the closest thing we would get to a War Games match this year, Filthy Animals, this uh, being Rey Mysterio Jr., Juventud Guerrero, Conan, and Tigress, along with Disco, aka Disco Inferno, Big Vito and Paul Orndorff fought the Natural Born Thrillers, Mark Jindrak, Sean O'Hare, Mike Sanders, Chuck Palumbo, Sean Stasiak, Reno, and Johnny the Bull to a 16 and a half minute no contest. In the first scaffold match in many years in WCW, Shane Douglas and Tori Wilson defeated Billy Kidman and Medusa. In a bunkhouse brawl, Mike Awesome defeated Jeff Jarrett. And in the final match of the night for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship, Booker T defeated Ke champion Kevin Nash in a caged heat match. Which is just, it's a, it's a cage match. And we'll go ahead, since we got a few minutes, let's, let's discuss the eliminations in the Not Quite War Games match. Conan was eliminated by Sean O'Hare. Disco was eliminated by Reno. Big Vito 
was eliminated by Reno. Reno was eliminated by Rey Mysterio Jr. Juventud Guerrero was eliminated by Sean O'Hare. Johnny the Bull was eliminated by Paul Orndorff. Paul Orndorff was eliminated by Sean O'Hare. And at that point, the match was canceled due to Orndorff suffering a stinger while pile driving Jindrak. Um, a stinger, also called a burner or nerve pinch injury, is a neurological injury suffered by athletes in high contact sports. Um, it is considered a spinal injury and is characterized by shooting or stinging pain that travels down one arm. Uh, followed by numbness and weakness in parts of the arm. It's kind of an infamous thing because sometimes stingers can be recovered from pretty quickly depending on the age and uh, physical durability of the athlete in question. Unfortunately, Paul Orndorff was an older wrestler who was not at his physical peak at the time. He had previously suffered uh, nerve damage in one of his arms in, while he was in WWF in the 80s. And as such, um, really was not in any kind of condition where he could have dealt with a very frightening injury like this. Um, uh, this was Orndorff's retirement. It was a horrible way for an iconic wrestler to go. And it reinforces something that I... Um, Really wasn't planning on talking about it tonight because I forgot this <laughs> fall brawl was where Orndorff had his stinger that encouraged him to retire. But it, it's one of those things that I really dislike about the so-called indie style of wrestling, and that is that you've got, you've got guys that are younger and younger suffering stingers and concussions and other injuries, where it's you know they're having to have things like you know neck surgeries and spinal fusion surgeries you know some of them before they're 30 and I mean just the idea of having to have a neck injury from not even like one big thing like what Steve Austin had and Owen Hart unfortunately had difficulty hitting the pile driver on him um, may Owen Hart rest in peace but um, but a lot of times it's just cumulative damage from them taking bumps they have no reason to take and it's just it's you know just remember folks when you watch that match at that point in his career Paul Orndorff should not have been in the ring um, and should not have been taking the bumps that he was taking. I mean, this wasn't the first time he had had a scare in that last, you know, year or so he was in WCW as an active competitor. Um, I mean, it's just, it's a thing. It's the price is not worth it. As a fan, I'm going to tell you the price is not worth it. Guys need to rest a safer style, need to uh, not get into wrestling until they have you know, taking some really good anatomy courses and understand how the human body works and why things like stingers and concussions occur and why you should take them very seriously. And I know that seems like a downer note to the video, so I am going to close it out real quick by saying, um, by all means, as I said, uh, the all the fall brawls, are available on the WWE Network. Uh, you should check out any of the matches I mentioned. And you should definitely uh, keep it in mind. It's a great way to spend September. 
Digging your wrestling past and enjoy seeing guys like Chris Jericho who are still competing uh, in their youth and having some of the matches that made him one of the most talked about wrestlers in the business. It's awesomeness. It's a great idea. And as for the rest, you know, unfortunately, some of the wrestlers I mentioned are no longer with us for different reasons including Paul Orndorff. Um, and I had mentioned Bobby Eaton earlier. But even though some of them are not with us, some of them are retired, you can still watch them and be happy. You know, look at their legacy and appreciate it for what it is. Guys who went out there and did amazing athletic feats in order to make us believe in superheroes and supervillains. Because that is that is pro wrestling at its, at its purest, at its most basic. It is making us believe in larger-than-life humans. And just getting 100% invested in their struggle. 